men and they used to fight us. And that, those fights used to get very violent and out of control. And then when I was listening to his speech, I was remembering all that. And now I was sitting with this young, this young man, and he's sitting with me as brothers. And we met and we embraced after that lecture, and we've been very good friends ever since. And it just shows you Islam's great unifying capacity. Another interesting instance of this, since that one got erased from the tape, let me present this one because Hamid likes to get sound bites. Uh, but this one affected me very deeply. Again, I had been a Muslim for now going on about six weeks, seven weeks. And I don't know what happened. But one night we had a lecture in the masjid. And some African-American brothers were there. I was there. Grant was there. Another white American brother. Uh, there were brothers from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Palestine, Egypt, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. It was crowded. There was some difference of opinion. I can't remember what it was. I know it was political. It was some political issue. And then everything just erupted. The Saudi brothers started yelling at the Palestinian brothers. The Palestinians started yelling back at the Saudi brothers. The Americans started taking sides. The blacks were against the whites. <coughs> the Sri Lankan brothers were siding with the Pakistani brothers, with the Saudi brothers, against the Palestinians and the Americans. People were really starting to get angry. I remember some of the things that were being said. Oh, you Saudis, why don't you go back to the sand from where you came? And the Saudis said, what do you know, you Amrikis? You just became Muslim just the other day. And the white brothers said to the black brothers, yeah, but you know, you began with uh, Elijah Muhammad and all that sort of stuff. What do you know? You've been a Muslim for two weeks. And it was just going bananas. People were shouting at each other. It was getting angry. And you know Americans, when they get angry, they like to throw punches. And I swear, punches were about to get thrown any second. I mean, faces were red, veins were popping out. I saw the fist, Grant's fist was back like this. A couple of those black American brothers, they were ready for it. We were ready to go back to the 60s again and have a street battle right there in the masjid and drag those rest of those Middle Eastern brothers in with us. And we had gotten to such a rage and such a point of tension, and then all of a sudden, this little guy, Muhammad, I think his name was, and he was from Palestine. He never says anything. He's the most quiet guy in the mosque. I don't even think any of us realized he was there. He stood up, and while well, we're all standing up, ready to pounce on each other, and he stood up and he yelled, La ilaha illallah! <coughs> we all looked at each other. What did he say? And he shouted again, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah! Say it, brother! We sort of looked shocked. Is he okay? I said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. He said, Say it again, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. We all said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. He said again, with feeling, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. We all repeated, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. Come on now, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. <coughs> again, we shouted it, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. He said, Brothers, that's what we're about, and that's what binds us. Just look at us. And we all looked at each other. And then all of a sudden people were hugging and asking for forgiveness and everything like that. But he sees the point. That la ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah doesn't mean you just worship God. But that we are brothers and equals in that worship of God. And sisters as well. Brothers and sisters. And here it goes. It's going again. <clears throat> Seems that whenever I get emotional, that's what happens. <clears throat> These uh, two demands, the oneness of God and the oneness of man and unity of man under God, have throughout history been very difficult to keep together in any religious tradition. Say that again, Jeff. Throughout history, these two demands of monotheism, the worship of one God and the unity of all mankind under God have been very difficult to preserve both these implications of monotheism in any religious tradition. And the Quran gives us two very powerful and dramatic illustrations. What two communities am I talking about? The community of the Jewish faith, Judaism, and Christianity. These are the two uh, ultimate examples that the Quran provides. As you all know, the children of Israel is a people, in the, as they're presented in the Quran, who throughout most of their history, much of their history, are uniquely receptive to monotheism, to the worship of one God. 
and yet they live in a predominantly pagan environment. Outside influences frequently penetrate their community. We see it again and again in the Quran, causing them to waver from the teachings of their prophets. In the Quran, they appear as a nation in a constant struggle between worship of one God and heathen pressures. And this in part explains their need, the children of Israel's needs, to insulate themselves and isolate themselves from the social surroundings. And it explains their attempt to preserve and protect their racial and cultural purity. Now that in itself is not bad, but as the Quran presents them, the children of Israel came to see themselves as God's chosen people, not just in the sense that he favored them with many prophets, but in the sense that they were somehow better than the rest of humanity, that God made something like a superhuman race, a race that is above and beyond the other races, a race created for the benefit of all the other races, a superior race. And they saw themselves as God's chosen people to the exclusion of all others and as sons of God in the Old Testament sense, those especially loved by God, while all else are just there. Because of this, they could never, the Quran says, accept Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the final messenger of God because of his non-Jewish origins, even though he confirmed the essential message in their possession. The Quran continuously blames the children of Israel for their refusal in this regard and for their arrogance and for their exclusiveness. In short, as the Quran presents Judaism, its problem with Judaism is although it was successful in preserving belief in one God, it failed and was unable to accept the oneness of all mankind under God. Christianity in the Quran, the situation is almost completely the opposite, the reverse. Christianity goes back to the same biblical roots. It's such a brilliant example. Of course it is. I mean, it's revelation. But much more than Judaism, Christianity is a universal religion. It readily embraces all mankind. Sometimes, in the history of Christianity, sometimes it went too far in that. <laughs> it became violent in its attempt to get every, everyone within its fold. Christianity gets its solidity, its coherence, from an intense spiritual yearning to be known and loved by God. So while the Jews and the pagans of the Arabian Peninsula were stubbornly closed to the, any message that departed from their tradition, we see the Quran shows the Christians to be more easily affected by the spiritual force of the Quran. And so you see tears streaming down their eyes when certain verses are recited, etc. But the difficulty that such universal faiths as Christianity have, the difficulty they encounter, is what? It's the great diversity of people they bring in. Now why is that a problem? Because when you bring in all these people, you just don't bring their bodies. You bring their language. You bring their ideas. You bring their backgrounds. You bring their symbols. You bring their cultural practices. All these things could potentially pervert the religion. All their former religious ideas, all their cultural background, everything. They have, they're going to see, interpret things through that experience. And so that's always a potential danger to corrupt the purity of the teachings of the religion. From the Muslim view, such was the case with Christianity. And from the Quran's point of view, too. Although it eagerly embraces all mankind. It compromises in its tenets pure monotheism and leads too easily to associating others with God. Its language, which was inherited from uh, the Hellenic culture from which it sprang, uh, used language that's very symbolic, very uh, high in the sky, but it's very easy to uh, the symbolic language for people to allow strange interpretations into the faith, at least as we Muslims see it. Words like Son of God, Trinity, etc., three hypostases. You know, all these things are that come in uh, from the surrounding culture. Ideas that come from the mystery cults. Ideas that seem to be, they, it shares with Mithraism and some of the other religions in the region. As Christianity embraced all these peoples and invited them into the religion, those ideas did 
at least from the Muslim point of view, affect and distort the teachings of the Prophet. So here we see two different sides of the coin. One community successfully preserving faith in one God, belief in one God, but incapable of accepting the oneness of man under God. The other religion, community, faithfully embracing all mankind for the most part, but corrupting, at least from the Muslim point of view and the Quran's point of view, allowing corruption to seep in into the idea of one God. In this way, the Jewish-Christian experience exemplifies the dilemma faced by all of the great world religions, monotheism or universalism, where one or the other was compromised in an attempt to preserve one or the other. Are you following me so far? Islam struggled and still struggles with these internal tensions. And in the past, extreme measures were to be taken by Muslim scholars to protect, protect both implications of monotheism. Philosophical and mystical speculation were discouraged. All aspects of life were organized and put into Islamic law and systematized. All innovative thought forbidden through the adoption of taqlid, blind acceptance of early scholarly opinion. And pressures would continue to rise throughout the ages, but as the Islamic mainstream, for the most part, succeeded in placing the major sources and ideas of mainstream Islam on ice and preserved them in a type of suspended animation, which eventually would be just transformed to modern man, to us today, intact. Now, whatever the cost of Muslim civilization, of the severe steps taken by Muslim scholars of the past, and people like to argue about that, the two major features of Islamic monotheism, of Tawheed, the oneness of God and the oneness of man under God, were successfully united in Islam and passed on to future generations. And to my knowledge, I've studied just about every major world religion, at least from my point of view, when I studied the many world religions. Islam was the only one I ever saw that successfully combined both implications of monotheism, the oneness of God and the oneness of man, the two essential uh, implications of that. <clears throat> and for Muslims, this is one of the ways, one of the ways, how God, through Islam, completed his favor unto mankind. Okay. Uh, this will only take five more minutes. Our critic says, not so fast. Okay. Other religions had corrupted monotheism. Either one implication or the other. I'm willing to accept that. Islam faithfully preserved both essential implications of monotheism, with the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and through future generations thereafter. I'm willing to accept that. But, but why no future prophet? I mean, you've explained to me what Islam accomplished, what the mission of Prophet Muhammad accomplished, but I still don't see why no future prophet. How does that relate to this? Are you following me? But this only takes a minute. Right? You've probably already figured out the answer. Just consider the reverse. Consider the opposite. Let's say prophethood wasn't sealed with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let us say that the door to prophethood was left open. That when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died, the Muslims felt that other possible prophets could come after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What would, been, what would have been the result? Well, every other religion has known it. Deluded individuals, self-deluded individuals, sometimes self-interested individuals would arise to claim they were prophets. Every religion, you have the people that do this. Right? They arise from the community and say, I am a prophet. David Koresh, Jim Jones, the Maharishi, etc. They all rise up and say, I am a prophet. And as Muslims, if the door to prophethood was left open when Prophet Muhammad died, peace be upon him, we'd have to consider it. If you got up tomorrow and said, I'm a prophet, I've received revelation from God. I would have to at least hear what you hear you out. Okay, and then you tell me what your proclamation, and then I have to consider it and weigh it. And I might become one of your followers. And then you might arise and say, but I am a prophet. I have received revelation from God. 
Jimmy Swagger did. I have received revelation from God. Then I'd have to, I, Jimmy Swagger claims, I would have to consider your point of view. And then some of us would go over to you. And some of us would go over here. And some of us would go over here. And some of us would go over here. Why? Because the door to, we are anticipating a coming prophet. So any person who makes that claim, he's bound to draw followers. And we can see the religion fragmenting. Followers of this guy who claimed he was a prophet. Followers of this guy who claimed he was a prophet. Every religion has known it. And every religion has had to deal with it. And every religion has been fragmented and disintegrated by it. But, Islam, with the sealing of prophethood with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tremendously restrained that tendency. Any Muslim leader today, he could gain the devotion of his followers. He could gain the supreme respect of his followers. They might be willing to die for him, to protect him. They might love him tremendously. But he would never get that, un, that complete and total submission, that complete and total confidence that divine messengership demands. The minute a Muslim scholar or a Muslim leader says, I am a prophet, I've received revelation from God, I have a new scripture, I have a new revelation. Every Muslim knows that he is gone. He is outside of this religion. From the scholar in his citadel to the, the Muslim on the street, the minute he hears somebody say, I'm a prophet of God, I'm the messenger of God, stay away from that guy. All right? Remember Rashad Khalifa. People were curious about it, what he was saying. He's doing all this strange stuff with the computer. Actually, I looked at his stuff. I wasn't impressed at all. But in any case, he was doing all this stuff with the computer. People were naturally curious. He was making bold and radical claims. People wanted to know what he had to say. Even, the, even I, I thought he was a crackpot, but I still wanted to know what he had to say. But the minute he sent out that bulletin saying, I am the messenger of God, everybody said, this guy's nuts. <laughs> And a few years later, he da died with only a handful of followers. Because every Muslim knows, once he made that claim, he's crazy. Right? And he's not going to bring many followers with him. Non-Muslim scholars call the Qadianis, the Baha'is, the Druze. They call them Islamic sects. Muslims don't call them Islamic sects. We don't consider them alternative perspectives in Islam. We don't even consider them heretical perspectives in Islam. Muslims consider them completely outside of Islam. And these movements had won very few converts from the Muslim community. By and large, they've gotten their converts from the Zoroastrian community, the Christian community, various other communities, but they've won very, very few from the Muslim community. Especially when you think there's a billion Muslims out there, they've won virtually none. Why? Because all these groups claim a prophet after Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. So when Allah sealed prophethood with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it was a key moment in history because with the mission of Prophet Muhammad, he brought both implications of monotheism to mankind and guaranteed their preservation, the oneness of God, the worship of only one God, and the unity of all mankind under God. There would be a continual witness of that on earth and the only community that I think, at least, witnesses that in pure, unadulterated form on earth. That's our charge. That's our duty as Muslims, to be a continual witness to both those implications. And with the sealing of prophethood with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Allah guaranteed that that community would stay together through thick and thin, or at least we should, remain unified, and by sealing the prophethood with Prophet Muhammad, Allah guaranteed in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, as he says in the Quran, Allah is all-knowing when he talks about the sealing of prophethood with Prophet Muhammad, because he knows what we're like. By sealing it with Prophet Muhammad, he protected us from the fragmentation, the disintegration that would naturally set in if he didn't seal prophethood with Prophet Muhammad. So this was a powerful way that Allah brought both implications of monotheism to mankind for his own benefit and guaranteed its preservation. When we Muslims make the Shahada, 
And we do. As a matter of fact, we state La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah 17 times a day in our daily prayers. We all know that when we say that, and we say the second half of that statement, Muhammad Dan Rasulullah, Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah, we all say, and we all acknowledge when we say that implicitly, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the la not only the Prophet, but the last Prophet, and the one that all, that we, the only one that we should follow at this point, in the revelation of the Quran. Could I give you one last example of, uh, and then I'll let you go to sleep? Because you guys really look tired, but this example touched me very deeply. It takes me about three minutes to describe. It's so easy for us to this day in our, to acknowledge and preserve one implication of Tawheed and neglect its corollary, the oneness of man under God. I see it time and time again in our Muslim community, and I've even seen it with myself on many occasions. Here's my own personal example. How easy it is, in, sometimes in our zeal, to hold on to one to contaminate the other. I was on a pilgrimage a few years ago, and I went to Saudi Arabia, worked in a university there for a year. I don't like to travel. I don't like desert heat. <laughs> I, I just, I'm the type of person who likes to stay home, but I went there because I thought, at the very least, I'll get to go to the pilgrimage. It was a miserable year for me. It was just terrible. And after I made the pilgrimage in July, a couple weeks later, I'd be getting on a plane and going back to the United States. But I was so emotionally and psychologically exhausted. You don't know how many battles I fought there in Saudi Arabia when I was there. The people are, are wonderful people, by the way. But, you know, cultural differences and things like that. But in any case, in any case, I got to that pilgrimage. I was weary, exhausted, frustrated, exasperated. But I thought, if anything good is going to come out of this, it's going to be the pilgrimage, and I am going to do it right. And I studied for months before I got there, memorized everything. I knew exactly what to do. I got to that pilgrimage. Well, it was it started out beautifully. Brothers, even sisters from all over the world, everywhere I went. Are you, are you an American? Yes, I'm an American. Uh, can you tell me how you became a Muslim? I would stand there and start telling people, and there'd be a big crowd around. It made me feel sort of special. I didn't know see another guy with blonde hair, blue eyes like me, <laughs> Germanic looking. The whole time I was there, until the very end, I saw one guy, he sort of passed me, looked at me. <gasps> but, 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 but in any case, I could see why I was, I felt like a novelty almost, you know? But unfortunately, I got the famous pilgrimage flu about 12 hours into the pilgrimage. And by the second day, I had it big time. I had a temperature of 105, the heat was getting up to 120 something. You know, if you're in Minna or Mecca, there's these huge cliffs on the side, and you know, you're in like this tiny little valley, like a pot almost, and when that heat comes down, it's 125 outside, it's like 150 ground level. All right, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it just, the heat just, just rises from the ground, and it's tar now, it's tar of the soil. So it just bakes there, and that heat rises up. At 105 fever, I was getting sicker and sicker. I was tired of explaining to people how I became a Muslim. I didn't want to talk to anybody anymore. I was sort of hiding my face, hoping nobody would see me. You know, the days went by. We got to the fourth day, the fifth day. I just used to hide, try to get out of the heat. The temperature was getting worse. We sat in those refrigerated buses. I felt like I was in a, a freezer. I felt like I was sitting on ice cubes. I was shivering so much. I'd go outside and walk, and I'd just be sweating like crazy. I was getting sicker and sicker day by day. Got to the, you know, through the stones, got all that done, just got it over with, got hit in the head. I was just, <laughs> I was just so beaten up. I'll tell you, you know, I thought the fasting was hard. Praying five times a day, I, I, I love, but, you know, that's a challenge. But the pilgrimage, I'll tell you. You know, it may be easier to get there now than it ever was before, but it's harder to perform all the rituals than it ever was before. I mean, I got into that masjid after I went back to the mosque that sixth day, and, you know, the last time I'm going to visit the mosque, then I'm going to pack up, leave, and go back to Jeddah, and from there to the United States. I got to that mosque, and it was more crowded than ever. I mean, it seemed like all two and a half million pilgrims were in there. And they said it was the hottest day of the pilgrimage. And I was going around and making the rounds around the Kaaba, and, you know, the crowd was so huge, you just, you can't, you don't even bother walking. Just let them just sort of drag you along, you know? I mean, it's just, this press of humanity just moves you along, and here I am, sick, you know? <laughs> I could hardly stand there, just be moved back and forth, back, you know, going around. Same thing when I make the, you know, sigh between Safa and Marwa seven times. 
took me, I've done it before, you know, just Umrah, and I've done the whole thing in 45 minutes. This day it took me two and a half hours, you know, I just had to wait for the mass of humanity to get through. Okay, so I finally make it there, I'm dripping, I'm not, not the type of guy who sweats, I was dripping hurt to toe, I mean, I was just covered in water, I mean, my, everything, my, my clothes were all wet. I just got out of there and, you know, I wanted to get a deep breath, cool breath of fresh air, that heat just blasts at you like a huge, gigantic hair blower, you know, it just hits you in the face. I saw an air-conditioned bus come down, you know, from Minna, got in the bus, I thought that would take me back to where my own bus was, I'd get off and, and finally leave. Well, I got in a bus and I didn't want to talk to anyone. I purposely picked a seat in the back of the bus where no one would bug me. I just figured I'll just go back here, I'll close my eyes, I'll let, pretend I'm sleeping, nobody will bother me, I'll just, you know, get off and get out. But sure enough, I get in the bus, I sit down, I lie there, keeping one eye slightly open, seeing if anybody is looking at me. A face turns around from the front of the bus, he's looking back at me, I think, oh no, please don't come this way. I look again, yes, he's walking, he's walking down the aisle. Please don't sit next to me. Please don't sit next to me. Boom, I feel a body sitting next to me. Maybe he just didn't like the front of the bus. I was thinking, I was hoping, you know, maybe he just won't bug me. Maybe he'll think I'm sleeping. <laughs> Close both eyes tight, please. I don't want to hear those words. And then sure enough, are you an American? <laughs> so I'll just pretend I didn't hear him. I'll close my eyes a little tighter. Excuse me, are you an American? <laughs> I open one eye just slightly. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Maybe that'll be enough, I'm hoping. He says, uh, would you mind telling me how you became a Muslim? <laughs> <laughs> the man's name, his name was Ahmed. He was from Bangladesh. I thought, okay, I'll tell him. I reduced it down to like a 15 second explanation by now. I used to tell him five, 10 minutes the first day. Now it was a 30 second spot, like a little sound bite. I told him while well, I was an atheist, I had several objections about religion. I read the Quran, I found those objections, I resolved them. I found much more in the Quran. Actually, once those barriers were broken down, I was moved deeply and I went to the masjid and became a Muslim. <coughs> I thought, well, maybe that'll kill it. That'll just about do it. I look up at my friend, and I just look through the, my eyelashes at the guy, and sure enough, tears are flowing down his cheeks. And I looked at him, and I felt so guilty. Because I always hoped that God would give me that spiritual quality, that something that small could move me so deeply, as this moved Ahmed. I mean, here I butchered the explanation, reduced it to 20 seconds, said it arrogantly and exasperatedly, and still he was that moved. And then Ahmed looked at me and he said, you know, Prophet Ibrahim was much different than you and I. He had such sincerity, such faithfulness to Allah, that when Allah told him to do something, he, his personality was so molded by Allah that he would just do it without question knowing that there was a wisdom and a genius and a knowledge behind it. He said, you know when Allah told Prophet Ibrahim to go out and make the call for the pilgrimage, there was no one else there. Maybe a few sheep herders, a couple members of his family. And he's told to go out and call for the pilgrimage. If it was you or I, Ahmed said, we wouldn't, we'd say, what? There's nobody here. We'd have second thoughts. But Prophet Ibrahim had such sincerity, such trust, that he knew that there was a wisdom behind it. And he just walked out to the center of this hot valley and he called the Adan and called, and called for the pilgrimage. And he said, and if only Prophet Ibrahim could see today people from all over the world, two and a half million, thronging to this place, responding to that call. He said, and who, and if he can only see two brothers, one from the United States of America and the other one from Bangladesh, sitting as brothers on a bus back to Minna. How that would touch his heart. And I looked at Ahmed 
And now I was choking back the feelings. <laughs> Americans don't like to cry, so I was really worth this. I was working, you know, you know, trying to just hold it in, you know, not let them show any feelings or not. And I and I was successful. But I'll tell you the truth that when he said that, I felt like I had to just repeat the entire pilgrimage again. Because, you know, throughout that pilgrimage, I had done every ritual formally right. I had rehearsed them for months. I got myself all worked up about it. I was going to make sure that I was going to worship Allah perfectly, that pilgrimage. But by that last day in Mecca, that last day, I had forgotten somehow, through it all, the second most important implication of the worship of one God, that we are all brothers and sisters as Muslims and, as in, and in humanity under God's authority and under God's love. And it took Ahmed on that last day to remind me of that. And I thank Allah for sending me. I only wish, well, Allah knows best. I guess that's the way he wanted to teach me. But for my own sake, if I would have had it otherwise, maybe I would have had him come earlier and tell me. But maybe that's the time I needed it most. And may the peace and mercy of Allah be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Can you lower the sound a little bit on, on that one? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. And, uh, may Allah bless you for your trip. I guess uh, his experience in Hajj is an experience of uh, an American making Hajj, which makes a big difference than people who are raised in the desert and people who are used to the heat of the desert. And uh, inshallah, next time you won't have the same difficulties, hopefully, inshallah. Uh, we are going to have some time for the questions. So please, if you have, you can write your question, bring it to me if you don't want to speak, speak out. Or you can come to the mic and uh, please make your, your question. Can, can you help us turn the lights on? I don't know who turned them off. Well, it's better you come and uh, speak from the... I turned it off because it's... Yeah, sorry about the audio problems. Any questions, please? Yes. Does this work? Use this one. No, it's not working. Hello? Hello? Okay. There is there is no mic working in, in the hole. Unfortunately, the, the sound system here oh with God, the speakers people out there. got some problems, and we try to figure out where the speakers, the control of the speakers are. Uh, so there is no mics that are working, so you can speak where you're sitting, where you are. I like them to that. I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on the indication of oneness of Allah and the unity under the one God. And the way I was always understood it, I mean, you have a good mind, so I have to think about it. Uh, always was, even in the Judaism, the corruption of oneness of Allah, like. Uh, understand also they have that problem like the Krishna. Which comes first, I think uh, if you explain a little bit more, is that a scholar also uh, reading the book? No. No, it's just from my first of all I uh, I I just I just read the Quran, you know. The, if you look at the history of uh, the children of Israel as presented in the Quran, you're right, they are wavering. You know, between uh, adherence to the idea of the oneness of God, and then they uh, g corruption sets in. Another prophet comes, brings them back. Corruption comes back. Corruption comes back. This is their history. You can see it as a community constantly battling with this tension. 
you know, between belief in one God and the pagan influences around them. But from what I know of Judaism, they were finally successful in preserving and guarding that idea, the oneness of God. This much Judaism, I think any, even Muslim scholar who knows Judaism, it's not, it's not up here. Any Muslim scholar who knows Judaism, any scholar of Judaism, anybody who knows Judaism will know that they were finally successful in preserving belief in the oneness of God. But as Jews will also tell you, that they are not, they don't easily and readily embrace others into the religion to this day. And uh, I've, had, I've had a good friend that once tried to be, enter the Jewish religion and they told him that he would not be really totally fully accepted as a Jew, but in a few generations his children might, you know, a few generations down the line. So the point of it is though, as the Quran presents the Jews, and as we know about the Jews, they were successful in pre preserving the oneness of God, this belief. But they failed in accepting the oneness and spiritu spiritual and essential equality of all mankind. But this was the reason why they couldn't accept Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Quran says that this confirmed, the message confirmed what was, what was in their possession. But they couldn't accept him because why? It's non-Jewish origins. You see what I mean? So what I was saying was the Jewish religion was capable of preserving one fundamental implication of monotheism, but they failed in the other. The Christians, on the other hand, are a very universal religion. They readily seek new Christians and converts, and they always have. And they've always been a very spiritual religion. And you see them very moved easy, easily spiritually in the Quran. The Quran itself admits that. Even says, as opposed to the Jews, for example, it says the Christians are humble. They're humble. And the tears flow from their eyes when they hear the truth of what's being recited before them. So they are very uh, much, as a community, they've been much more willing to embrace mankind. And they've always been a universal religion. But as they accepted more and more outside influences into their community, it obviously became corrupted. This is a well-established fact. And the Quran criticizes many of these corrupt beliefs that the Quran says are corrupted beliefs that came into the religion. Corrupted terminology, Trinity, Son of God, etc., etc., etc. So the point is, is that Christianity was able to embrace all mankind, but it was unable to preserve in its pure form uh, belief in the oneness of God. It's too easily corrupted. It leads people too easily into false ideas about God. The terminology of Christianity, it's very clear that this is true. You know, there's many Christians today, if you walk up to an average Christian on the street, you may walk up to a Christian scholar and he could say, no, there's only one God. And we pray to God through Jesus, in Jesus' name. You know, and you're trying to think, well, I mean, is he or is he? I mean, what does this... But for the average guy on the street, this is very confusing. And you can walk up to the common Christian. And all he does is hear the phrase, three persons and one God. He hears the phrase, he's taught, son of God. He's taught, God incarnate. He learns this terminology. And many a Christian, if you approach him, I would say the majority of common Christians, if you ask them, does, does Christianity believe that Jesus is divine? Does it believe that Jesus is God's son? Does it believe that Jesus should be worshipped? Does it believe that Jesus is God? Many Christians will say yes. And they admit that they pray to him. And of course, for Muslims, this is worship of a man. So the point of it is, is Christianity may have embraced all mankind, but it corrupted, or it's too easily corruptible when it comes to the belief in one God. Are you following me? The only re you can look at the rest of the world religions. I did. And I don't mean to criticize them. I'm just making a case from a Muslim perspective. I'm not here to put down other people's beliefs. But when I studied Hinduism, for example, I found that Hindu Hinduism allows for the belief in many deities and many gods. It doesn't insist on it. There are even some Hindus that are monotheists. Some are monists. And some are pagans. But Christ 
Hinduism allows for all that. So, to me, there's another sign of a type of corruption there. Not only that, it has a caste, or it's, it, throughout much of its history, it had a caste system, which violates the oneness and unity and spiritual equality of all mankind under God. When I turn to Buddhism, Buddhism doesn't, the, the main issue in Buddhism is how to get past the suffering that this life has. How to get out of the cycle of suffering. It brings God into the picture hardly at all. You could actually never even discuss God and just follow the program. So Buddhism sort of got, the problem I've always had with Buddhism is it sort of ignores God. Which certainly is not the type of monotheism that the Quran says that we should believe in. Taoism, Confucianism, two of the other major world religions. To me, they seem more like philosophies than religion. God hardly ever arrived on the scene. Let's talk about the balance in nature, the balance in creation, the, the, yin, the yin and the yang. Everything is, has a balance. The causality in nature, etc., etc. That's all very nice. It's a beautiful philosophy. It's probably a lot of truth in it. But where is God? You know? So my point is, is that the only religion that insists on both as both implications of Tawheed and has preserved both the implications and has been a witness to both implications ever since it first received them is the Muslim community. And this is part of their mission on earth. I hope that answers your question in part. Thank you. Here is a question from uh, the sisters here. Oh, what... Uh, What's your best advice as far as uh, an American Muslim, as, as an American Muslim, for us who, was, uh, who were uh, born and raised in Islam, Muslim cultures, what's your best advice for us who want to make uh, dawah for uh, American people, who want to share their uh, point of view with American people, their religious point of view, perspective with American people? That's a very hard question. <laughs> I would say... Uh, Maybe the example of the jewel that you gave before. Yeah, uh, one example I always tell people. Uh, really, I really, deep in my heart, I believe the best thing you could do is, number one, the first thing not to do, first thing you should try to avoid, is don't answer a question if you're not sure about the answer. Uh, Muslims are notorious for doing that. Uh, giving answers with great authority when they really are not quite certain about what they're saying. Maybe it's something their grandmother told them. Maybe it's something they heard somebody make in a Friday prayer. Muslims somehow feel that when you ask them a question, they have to have an answer. And so they rush out and blurt out something. They feel that sometimes to have any answer is better than to have no answer. When in fact, to admit you have no answer is usually better than give a wrong answer. That's one thing to avoid. Second thing, try not to mix... And if you're unsure, just leave the matter alone. Try not to mix sort of cultural adaptations to the religion with the essentials of the religion. You know what I mean? Uh, all of us, all of our cultures, uh, adapted. All, most of us are children of converts. All of us are children of converts to Islam. Most of us are children of converts to Islam, and those converts, I mean descendants of converts, and those original Muslims that we trace our lineage back came from vastly different cultures. Each of those cultures, as it adapted to the religion, made that ad adaptation, that interpretation, through the eyes of that culture. That doesn't mean that how this fellow's culture adapted to the, this precept of the religion was wrong, but that doesn't mean this other cultural adaptation here was wrong either. It doesn't mean that his adaptation was an interpretation is irreligious, but it doesn't mean his is irreligious either. They are seeing it from very different points of view and circumstances. But what we have a tendency to do as Muslims is insist that our point of view, our particular cultural perspective on a certain religious question is the only one. And we insist on it, and we dogmatize it, and we present that to an American non-Muslim as a fact, as an essential. And very often we're doing tremendous damage because it doesn't allow 
for any him for any room to see or relate to that part of the religion, you shut the door. He can, cannot possibly relate to it because he can't become that, enter that cultural perspective. That's the second thing. Third thing, try to stress the essentials of the religion, and that, of course, you have to. We have to study and learn the essential precepts of our religion. Try to stress those. Most important, I would suggest that you should do what somebody did with me once, and. Uh, as somebody who's, when you're dealing with somebody who's sincerely and really intently interested in Islam, knowing what Islam represents, I would really uh, boldly uh, put forth this, uh, that you, uh, one time, I'll just add a, in a short story, one time, I, and I'll mention this tomorrow, one time I got very frustrated, I was discussing something with Muslims, and I, they weren't making sense, and I kept cornering them and trapping them, and they were getting very frustrated, and they'd say, uh, you know, well, God did this and this, and I'd say, yeah, but if he did that, that doesn't make sense because this contradicts that, and then they'd say, oh, yeah, but that, and I was, they were getting run into circles, and they were really starting to sound kind of crazy and foolish. And finally, the smartest one among them said to me, look, doctor, we don't really know. The questions you're asking are beyond anything we've ever considered. If you really want to know the answer, why don't you just read the Quran? Because, you know, we're human beings. We're trying to explain it to you. But we believe that the Quran is God's revealed word to all mankind. You're getting our meager understanding of the Quran, and we're trying to answer your question filtered through it. Go to the source. And I did. And I became a Muslim. So the point of it is, is, is that if you're in doubt, uh, back away and obtain more knowledge or send the person to somebody you, have, you feel have a greater knowledge on that issue. And second, don't be discouraged from uh, telling the person to get, and you can find them in any U.S. library, to go get a translation of the Quran with commentary, an interpretation of the Quran with commentary. And you could suggest, and that's very important, know some very good ones ones that people who have converted to Islam thought were very good. Find out from them what worked for them. And uh, I would try to send people in that direction, really. I would send them, I usually tell people myself, I have a list of books in mind that I think are very good. I have uh, some interpretations of the Quran that I think are very good. And I usually tell Americans, I usually begin by answering their questions, very, whatever they have, very shortly. And then I tell them, you know, this book, this book, this book is probably uh, quite good. And this interpretation of the Quran by so-and-so, I enjoyed very much. And then they could go ahead and if they're interested and truly interested, they could look at those and uh, without any coercion or pressure, consider them. And I think that's a very good way to go about it. Okay, any more questions? Yes, bro. Thank you, sir. In uh, your uh, analogy, bro, uh, there is no need to uh, find a profit. Uh, somehow, I didn't hear uh, from you mentioning anything about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this is the last message. And he preserved that last Actually, I did mention that. I mentioned that as one of the classical arguments, but I said that still many non-Muslims that I've talked to, and I've told them this, I mean, I've presented that in front of audiences, exactly what you're talking, and I did mention it along the way. Maybe you just missed it, or maybe the language I was using was... <laughs> but I did really mention it. I mentioned how that uh, Muslims will say that this was the unadul unadulterated word of God, perfect revelation. There's no need for a revelation after this because now this is the final perfect form of revelation, preserved in its original language, etc., etc., etc. This is not a corrupted text. 
in any case, I was trying to make that point. But I was saying that still, a non-Muslim will ask, yes, okay, but what about interpreting that message? You know? And then the Muslim will say, well, the Sunnah, we have the Sunnah. Yeah, but the Sunnah didn't cover everything, the non-Muslim will say. No, no, not humanism. But the more, okay, so then we go from the Quran, then we go to the Sunnah, then we go to the Sharia. Yeah. That, now the Sharia didn't cover everything that comes up in modern times. So we have to revive that Sharia. And we have to repeat the effort made by ancient scholars. But in that process, human decisions are being made. Human interpretations are being made. I'm just presenting the non-Muslim argument. And the non-Muslim will say, what if you make mistakes in that? Wouldn't it be beneficial if you had a divinely guided messenger to put you on the right track every time? Are you following me? But still, you have to interpret that source. You know, Muslims are fighting and arguing about 100,000 issues. I mean, I'm not, I'm not arguing that we need another messenger. I'm just saying that I can understand the non-Muslims' argument. Wouldn't it be great if we had a continuous, permanent messenger always with us? him and then the next and then the next always resolve every little legal issue we have? Why, I mean, wouldn't it be nice? And if God is all merciful, why doesn't he give us that benefit? This is their typical argument. Well, yes.